During his tenure, he led initiatives to eradicate the guinea worm and eliminate river blindness, among other accomplishments. In, 19, in 1997, he joined the faculty at Emory University at the Rollins School of Public Health and remains an emeritus presidential distinguished professor for the university. In 1990, he became the senior medical advisor for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, directing the foundation's global health initiatives. Dr. Fagy's awards and publications are too numerous to chronicle. However, it is estimated that his life's work has saved the lives of 122 million people around the globe. He continues to champion programs which improve global child survival and development. Dr. Fagy was recently awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor our country bestows on a civilian. It is my privilege and honor to present to you Dr. William Fagan. Thank you so much. Thanks for such a nice introduction, and I can tell the rest of you, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> it is a, a real pleasure to be here, and it's an exciting day. I had a friend at CDC by the name of Hod Ogden, and on his deathbed, he asked a colleague if she would write his obituary. She agreed. Within hours, he went into a coma, and then the word went around that he was within hours of dying. The next morning, he surprised everyone by waking up. And he lived for quite some time after that. And he used to say how nice it was to pick up on conversations that had been halted. But the, the nicest thing of all was the chance to edit his obituary. <laughs> and so I say to the students back there that you are editing your obituary every day and you will for every day of your life but it doesn't stop there because the fact that we're having the James McClellan lecture means we're even editing his obituary because you see how his influence continues to go out even after he has died. It's also exciting to have so many of his family here to uh, help with this honor. And it's nice to have so many, so many people from my family, including three sisters and three brothers-in-law. And you'll be able to identify them as the people who try to get me to sit down. <laughs> Yesterday, we saw so many wine tasting places as we drove around and it made me think of three years ago, my wife and I went back to India for the celebration of 30 years without smallpox. On our way back, we changed planes in Paris, and as we were waiting to board the plane in Paris, going through the security line, it struck me that there was something going on ahead of us, and so we listened, and there was a man arguing with the security people. He simply couldn't understand that France would not allow a bottle of French wine to go through security. And they said, if it's over three ounces, you can't take it through. He argued, he found out that he was going to lose. He looked around at the crowd. He opened that bottle and drained it. <laughs> he threw the bottle into a wastebasket and he took that French wine right through security. <laughs> C.P. Snow is remembered for having said that the gap would never be bridged between the humanities and science. And since he said that, science has just exploded. But people in the medical profession bridge that gap every day as they focus on both humanities and science. Roger Bacon, 700 years ago, was asked by the Pope to do a summary of science. And I recall three things from his summary. Number one, he really loved science. He predicted automobiles and airplanes and submarines and telescopes. Number two, though, he said, science has no moral compass. 
And number three, he chastised the church for not providing guidance. And I've always suspected, since he didn't get into trouble, that the Pope didn't actually read that summer. <laughs> but he would still say the same thing, that science has no moral compass, and he would worry about all of the organizations that are not involved in providing one. My plan today is, is quite simple. I'd like to say just a few words about the place we're in right here, then say something about humanity and medicine, come up with a few lessons from smallpox eradication, and then look for bigger lessons from the human condition and what this means for science and medicine. Some notes on the history of where we are right now. Every person in here has a history. And the intermingling of these histories becomes so complex. I once gave a talk where I used the phrase global village and my son asked me afterwards, do you know who you're quoting when you say global village? And I said, I think I'm quoting Marshall McLuhan from Canada. And he said, no, you're quoting Polybius. And I'm not sure I even knew who Polybius was when he said that. But he brought me the quote where Polybius said 2,000 years ago, it may have been possible in the past for things to have happened in isolation but from this time forth, the world must be seen as an organic whole. Everything affects everything. And Polybius then gave examples of things happening in Africa impacting Athens. And so this is a complex, everything affects everything. And those of us here are really here with part of our history being the Western expansion. Now if I read my history books on the Western expansion, I learned that the government was very interested in something called manifest destiny. I read that the business people wanted to get furs and gold and silver, and that the military was interested in protecting all of these people. What I don't read in the history book are three things just as important as that, and that those three things are alcohol, syphilis, and smallpox. And I'm not going to go into the detail, but these things really ended up changing Western history. This hotel is named for Marcus Whitman. 1835, he started West being sponsored by a mission group, and the history of that is very complex. He then stopped at the rendezvous, which was held on the Green River in 1835, what, near what is now Pinedale, Wyoming. And that has a complex history that involves Lewis and Clark and John Coulter and Jedediah Smith and, and Indian tribes and all kinds of, of people. But he left that rendezvous with a reputation for two things. Number one, cholera had involved the, the settlers coming west. Now cholera history is complex and this was a pandemic that had moved out of what is now India and Bangladesh, across the world, a man by the name of John Snow won uh, his uh, esteem by taking the handle off the Broad Street pump and stopping an epidemic in London. But here's Marcus Whitman treating people with cholera at the 1835 rendezvous. But he also made his reputation because he met Jim Bridger. Three years earlier, Jim Bridger had been shot in the back with an arrow and his colleagues could not get that arrow out. So they ended up sawing off the shaft and leaving the head of the, the arrow head in his back. And Marcus Whitman came and he removed that arrow head. And so people knew his reputation. Twelve years later, of course, there's measles in the area. The Indian tribes had no idea about germ uh, theory. No one else did either. And they didn't know anything about bioterrorism, but they did observe that their death rates were higher than the death rates in settlers. They did observe that adults in their tribes were dying and the adults in the settlers were not dying. And that's what led to the massacre. And if I recall correctly, one of Jim Bridger's children was living with them at the time and was uh, killed at the same time. So even the, the name of this hotel is just complex with stories within stories. 
Humanity and the Practice of Medicine. I like the fact that this talk is to recall James McClellan and that his lesson is about humanity in the practice of medicine. It so inspired his peers that they now dedicate a lecture in his honor because they do not want to lose the power of what once dwelt amongst them. And so this is a very inspirational thing to talk about the uh, legacy that he has left. I struggled once with a talk that I was giving that required a definition of civilization. And I looked at what the historians had said where they talked about knowledge and wisdom as being measures of civilization or control of their environment. None of them work. One of the closest to working was happiness. But Will Durant, the great historian, said that doesn't work or the average three-year-old would be more civilized than their parents. <laughs> but there is a definition that does work and it turns out to be how people treat each other. That's the measure of civilization. And it's the way we define a civilized society or a civilized university or a civilized uh, group a civilized person, and James McClellan was a civilized person. But it shows that in medicine, you can, everyone can be a civilized person by the way they treat each other. There, there are other bridges, of course, that uh, we should think of in the profession. One is art and science. And we're told that the first scientist known by name was Imhotep from Egypt. He was a physician, he designed the step pyramid and he built the step pyramid. And Will Durant says, isn't that a great aspiration for even the last person in history to be both an artist and a scientist? But there are other bridges. And what we learn is there's something better than science. And that is when you add art, when you add the humanities. And so science in the service of humanity then becomes better than science alone. Richard Feynman, the physicist, used to say that certainty is the Achilles heel of science. And then he added, it's the Achilles heel of religion and politics and almost everything else. And he used to give examples. He said, physics, we know better than most subjects what is truth. But he said, every truth in physics is true only with a plus or minus to it. We don't actually know truth and that physicists will spend their lifetimes trying to prove something wrong. And if any of you have seen a periodic table recently, the things we were taught that were certain that the weight of hydrogen was one, it's now one plus or minus something. So beware of certainty, he says. And the history of medicine is striving to reduce uncertainty. Kierkegaard said only God knows truth, but he allows people to seek truth. And that's what we do in medicine, to seek truth and try to figure out what is the most certain. But we have a hard time, even with things like hand washing. Now hand washing, we're still struggling to get the rates above 50% in many hospitals in the United States. And yet we know from Semmelweis's time that he, this is before he understood germ theory, he understood that women were dying on the ward that was run by doctors at a higher rate than on the ward run by midwives. And he tried to understand this. And he came to the conclusion that doctors were doing autopsies first thing in the morning and then delivered babies without ever washing their hands. And he came up with a rule that they had to do hand washing before delivering babies and the death rates went down and the women on that ward. But there were earlier people who came to that same conclusion. Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. was a physician, took part of his training in France. He came to the same conclusion that hand washing was required. He wrote a paper about it. He didn't get any attention. He came back to the United States and went into practice. Recently, I found a paper by a man by the name of Gordon published in 1791, coming to the same conclusion, and again, they don't understand germ theory, but he said there's something going between doctors and patients, and he regretted 
the deaths he had caused because of that and he said we should wash hands. And I just went to a poster uh, session the other day where in one hospital in Africa they now had hand washing up to 30 percent. And I asked the person what is it in the US and she said rarely over 50 percent. So you see how hard it is to get certainty in even the things that seem to be true. So it's always a balance of art and science, and compassion and uncertainty. A few lessons from smallpox. And I'm not going to spend much time on this, but one lesson is it didn't ha eradication did not happen by accident. This is a cause and effect world. It's not a fatalistic world. And the pre-med students here would not be studying if they were fatalistic. But they actually believe they can change their future and the future of other people, so they are not fatalistic. In this country, surveys show that about 30% of Americans are fatalistic. That is, they don't think they can actually change their future. And so you see why it's so hard with that group to get them to stop smoking, for instance. They don't actually think they can make a difference. In some countries, it's as high as 80%. And I tell students, you know, it changes every day for every one of us. We get into situations where we become very fatalistic other times when we really feel in control. And I tell them, I'm most fatalistic when I get in a taxi. I've, I've lost control. <laughs> and I tell them the story of going to Philadelphia late one night and getting a taxi downtown to the hotel. And it's not that far. But there we were on the freeway and I suddenly realized I was smelling alcohol. You don't want to get out of the car at 11.30 at night on the freeway in Philadelphia. So I thought, I'll engage the driver in conversation and get some idea of how compromised he might be. So I said to him, you should know I'm a high risk passenger. And he asked me, what does that mean? And I said, well, I've been in five taxi accidents in my life, which is true. His response was, that's nothing. I've been in a lot more than that. <laughs> It's not a fatalistic world. It's a cause and effect world. But number two, you have to know the truth. And it's always hard to get the truth, but you have to know the truth to know what to do next. And that's true in clinical medicine. It's true in public health. Number three, it requires coalitions to get anything done. You see, Polybius was right that we are not isolated. Everything affects everything. Coalitions, leadership in health today goes not to a person with a title, but to a person that knows how to make a coalition actually work. And the last point that I'll make is trust is the glue that holds a coalition together. Some lessons from the general human condition. And Part of the general human condition is when you get to my age, your eyesight is not very good. <laughs> but one is the tyranny of time. Will Durant put it, the maddening stinginess of time. And Leon Trotsky said, the most unexpected thing that happens to people is old age. I always thought I would have more time, and now it's almost spent. And Dixon said, Time is like a coin. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. And so we become more and more jealous of the little time we have left. My point is it goes so fast, you might as well be good to people so you don't have to spend time apologizing. <laughs> How fast does it go? My birth was closer to the first presidential campaign of Abraham Lincoln than to the current presidential campaign. I mean, think of that. And the last Civil War soldier died while I was in medical school. And I say this to just remind the young people, time will go so much faster than you ever imagined. Second lesson, we always hear in our training, do no harm, and almost always, that is tied to an error of commission. The Institute of Medicine put out an entire book on do no harm 
errors of commission. They didn't mention errors of omission. I think we hurt, hurt far more people, kill far more people by the things we don't do. The science that's not shared, the vaccines that are not shared. Errors of omission. When I first went to Africa, 46 years ago, the person that saw me off, my boss, a surgeon, his last words to me, and don't ever do this to anybody, his last words to me were, oh, by the way, you'll never forget the people you kill. <laughs> and that kept bothering me. And then I came to realize, of course you forget the people you kill because you don't know them. Because we kill far more people by our errors of omission and therefore we don't know the result. And one of the biggest errors of omission is how we treat patients. When we, by omission, don't treat them as people. So a lesson that we can learn from James McClellan is that kindness and care can go together. But, and again I'm saying this for the young people, the more education you have and the more money you make, the harder it becomes for you to actually talk to poor people. And sometimes the poor people that come into your practice this will be the only true contact that they have with someone from the middle class for that year. And if there's to be a true connection, it will be because you make it, they won't know how to make it. And so it's important to not let power change the way you approach this. And we always hear about power corrupts, and this is uh, said to have been said by Lord Acton, and it probably was, but it was said by Isocrates 2,000 years earlier. And he said it in the very words we've become used to. That is, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But it wasn't until our lifetime, 2,000 years later, that someone improved on that saying. And it was a man by the name of Paul Warnicke who was a negotiator on weapons. And Paul Warnicke said, it may be true that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, but the most corrupting of all is the fear of loss of power. And all you have to do is look at Mugabe in Zimbabwe or politicians in this country and the fear of loss of power is truly corrupting. Third, we live in multiple spheres all the time. We live in the present but everything we do is totally dependent on what has happened in the past. And so I tell students to savor the history. You've walked into this story someplace in the middle. Savor what went before and anticipate what's going to happen afterwards. And to public health students, I tell the story of vaccines. Because it was Edward Jenner in 1796 who did the first vaccination. He had read where poets said milkmaids have nice complexions but he didn't understand why. And then a milkmaid said to him, well, I won't ever get smallpox because I've had cowpox. And he studied this for 12 years to see what would happen to milkmaids during outbreaks. And finally, 1796, he took material from the hand of Sarah Nelms, where she had a cowpox lesion from milking cows, and he injected it into the arm of James Phipps, a small boy, and if any of you are true history buffs, Sarah Nelms got the cowpox virus from a cow named Blossom. <laughs> but then he tried several weeks later, later to give James Phipps smallpox. And if any of you are on committees, <laughs> <laughs> and James Phipps did not get smallpox, that was the beginning of vaccinology, but it was also the beginning of modern public health. Well, the next big figure in vaccine history was Louis Pasteur. And when Jonas Salk died, I went to his memorial service, and a man from France, Charles Mariou, gave the history of vaccines. And he said it started in 18th century England with Edward Jenner, went to 19th century France with Louis Pasteur, to 20th century US with Jonas Salk. 
I had a chance to visit Charles Mariu in his late 80s in his home in France. And he showed me a picture on the wall and he said, that's my father working in the lab. He said, do you have any idea who the person is next to him? And I said, no. He said, that's Louis Pasteur. Well, Louis Pasteur once gave a talk in London and he said, we need to honor Edward Jenner because of what he did with smallpox vaccine. It's called vaccine after the name of the virus that's used to vaccinate people, which is vaccinia. But he said, to honor Edward Jenner, why don't we call all immunizing agents vaccines and call immunizations vaccinations? So that's how we happen to use these terms. Now I said to myself, I have just seen the history of vaccines because I know a man whose father worked with Louis Pasteur who said, this is how we will honor Edward Jenner. Saw the history. But then I thought, I've also seen the next chapter. Because there's a man by the name of Maurice Hilleman who was the Louis Pasteur of our time. Maurice Hilleman was born on a ranch in Montana and his twin sister died the day they were born. His mother died two days later. He grew up in a very tough situation, did not go on to college until a relative kept pushing him and he finally went on to college. And then he became this miracle of vaccine production. Over half of all the vaccines that go into our children came out of his mind. I mean, he is more than the Louis Pasteur of our time. I had the chance to give two Maurice Hilleman talks that he came to while he was still alive. And I said, the first one, this is Louis Pasteur of our time. And the second one, I said, I was totally wrong. He's so much greater than Louis Pasteur, we don't have anyone to compare him to. Now, unfortunately, he was also so profane, I couldn't call him up to comment on this. <laughs> it, uh, but think of what he has done uh, for the entire field. To medical students, I say, the first time you see a cardiac catheterization, think of Werner Forsman, who did the first one in 1929. And he did it on himself. He came up with the idea, presented it to his supervisor who said absolutely not, he'd have nothing to do with it. Werner Forsman though was so seized by the idea that he began having coffee with a scrub nurse by the name of Gerda Ditson, and she became a believer. They waited until there was a day when the operating theater was empty and they went in and she assumed he was going to do this on her and I've always thought she must have been in love with him. I mean, there's no other reason why you would allow someone to do that. But he strapped her down on the operating table. He went around to the head and he pulled out a urinary catheter that he had measured what he thought would be the right distance into his heart. Did a cut down on his arm and he put that catheter in with a four by four over it. He then comes around and releases her from the table because he needs her to help take the x-ray. And they go one or two stories, floors up or down, I can't remember, and they do get the x-ray. And his supervisor is so impressed by this, and the cardiologists here will know how dangerous that was, but he's so impressed by it, he has him do it four more times over the next six weeks. <laughs> he got the Nobel Prize in the 1950s. So know what this is about, know the history. Another lesson. The role of compassion. What is the role of compassion in all of this? Well, I can tell you 10 years ago, when I needed a cancer surgeon, I was looking for a person with great technical skills and a person with a big ego that didn't like to lose. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking of compassion. I, I wasn't even interested in compassion. But as I got to know him after this, I realized it was compassion that made him so skillful technically, that he spent the time to do this. He told me once, uh, you can be reassured, he said, I can't afford to lose you. Think of my reputation. <laughs> and so I found myself hiring people in global health, not looking at compassion, but how are they at problem solving? And I wanted people who just loved to solve problems and couldn't wait 
to get to the next problem. And then, of course, I found many of them are doing this because of compassion. So I stopped looking for ways to measure compassion and instead looked for ways to measure consequential compassion. There has to be something that comes out or it doesn't make any difference. The words of politicians, evangelists, labor leaders, medical leaders, Wall Street bankers, teachers, mental health workers, it doesn't matter what they say if nothing comes out of it. And so all of the promises made at the time that we had Katrina, or all of the pledges made after the earthquake in Haiti, and all of the pledges made for the Global Fund that haven't been met, they didn't mean anything. Bishop Tutu said, it's very hard to wake up a man who's pretending to be asleep. And so you find that after these promises are made and time goes by, people pretend they don't remember what they said. Bishop Tutu also said, frequently people think compassion and love are merely sentimental ideas. He says, no, if you really want to do that, it's hard work. Consequential compassion is hard work. Some things are exceedingly complex. Now, those of you who have taken biology know the term ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. None of us knew what that meant, but we knew how to spell it. We would pass the test. And basically what it means is every child actually recapitulates the whole family history of that child. Every bacterium, the same thing. Now when you have a patient with an infectious disease and you're now taking the history, it turns out that that particular uh, agent, whether it's a virus or bacteria, that particular agent has an entire history, has it gone through other species, has it had contact with antibiotics, has it uh, mutated within a body, has it taken on the characteristics of other bacteria and so forth. But the same thing with the human, the host now, has a history of what has happened to the ancestors, what kind of contacts this person has had with similar diseases and so forth. It becomes very complex. Then you go to malaria and now you're doing three family histories because there's a vector involved. And if you get to Nipah virus, uh, isolated recently in Malaysia, you have four different things, the, the virus, the human, uh, the, uh, a bat, and a pig. So it becomes very complex and, and the reason for saying this is when you take a history on a person, you're actually doing a complex look at history and bringing it down to a chief complaint and a few notes on your chart. Uh, and this is, in a sense, taking the history of all of humanity. And then when you've done that, here's a phrase I like. It came to me when I realized that Abraham Lincoln had no biological DNA in our gene pool at all. And yet every day you know the difference Abraham Lincoln has made. And the reason is he left social DNA. And so when you're done with this history that you've done on all of humanity, you're leaving social DNA for the future. And this is not only complex, but it's the way humanity and science finally come together. Do I have regrets? One of my regrets is I've known all my life that the single most important determinant of health is poverty. And yet we don't see this as being in our realm. And yet we now know that poverty is dose related. The more the poverty, the higher the illness rates. And so we should be treating it like we would treat high blood pressure or cholesterol and other things. And yet we don't. We let other people worry about poverty. One of the nice things about the discussion in the presidential campaign of 47% of people not paying federal income tax, the, the immediate return on, yes, but they pay state taxes, they pay license taxes, they are paying a lot of taxes. And I was asked to review a paper someone did called Skin in the Game. And I said, you've left out two huge areas. Number one, everyone in this room is actually subsidized by poor people. 
We get our clothes cheaper, our food cheaper, our services cheaper, because people are working at minimum wage in this country or other countries. So they are, in fact, subsidizing us. And we should be talking about a social equity tax paid by poor people. The other thing that strikes me as I watch the deaths in Afghanistan is the realization that our military force draws heavily now on poor people. And it means that they're paying a price for our freedom that exceeds what you should expect from that particular socioeconomic group. And not just a price in money, but a price in lives. And that we should be talking about the patriotic tax paid by poor people in this country. So use your reputation and use your skills to figure out what we can, and do, can do to improve the problem of poverty. And I often bring up William Wilberforce, who year after year after year introduced to Parliament a bill to make it unlawful to transport slaves in the UK. And he lost every year. And so after 30 some years, there's a new prime minister who says to him, maybe you're losing because you always introduce this in the House of Commons and it passes, and the House of Lords are not gonna have the House of Commons tell them what to do. So why don't you just turn it around? And so he introduced it in the House of Lords first, and it passed. And then he became, became worried. Oh, the House of Commons will say, we're not gonna let the Lords tell us what to do. And so he was very worried about this. And the debate started one night, and no one knew how long it would go, except a young man turned out to be a real orator. And he began talking about how Napoleon most powerful person in the world would not sleep well tonight because of all of the people he had hurt. But William Wilberforce, no matter what we vote, will go home and sleep well because he's trying to do the right thing. Pretty soon he had those people on their feet cheering. People called for the question and they voted yes. And all of a sudden, after all of those years, it was now unlawful to transport slaves in the UK. And there was a party afterwards and people were so euphoric except for William Wilberforce, and he asked, okay, what should we do next? We need that kind of person to take on poverty and change the way we view this. And finally, mentorship. It's an obligation for everyone, no matter what vocation we're in. Richard Feynman, in a speech at the University of Washington in 1963, he talked about science is nothing unless it's applied, and that's where the power of science comes. It's not powerful in a book or even in your mind. It's not powerful until it's applied. But then he said, every person is given this gift of a key that will open the door to heaven. Unfortunately, the same key opens the door to hell. Now what do we do? He said, do we throw away the key or do we struggle to try to figure out how to use it? And of course, we struggle to figure out how to use it. We have the key to medicine and we can make things better. Mentorship is part of the obligation we have of passing on what we've learned to the students, to the to people interested in this area. And I'm here today because it's obvious that James McClellan was a mentor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you mind a couple of questions? No. So the question is polio and the eradication efforts. And uh, polio has turned out to be more difficult, of course, than smallpox. Why? With smallpox, if you get the virus, you don't have 
many, maybe no subclinical cases. So if you get the virus, there is some expression of it. And with smallpox, that expression is a rash on the face, the arms, and the legs predominantly, but also all over the body. But those are the places that you can count on. So it makes surveillance easy. You know where the virus is. With polio, for every case of lameness or paralysis, you have between 100 and 1,000 people that actually have polio, but you don't know who they are. So it makes it much more difficult to do this. Nonetheless, when you see how year after year, new geographic areas have become free of polio, we know that it can be done. It's no longer a scientific problem, it's a political problem because the places that are the difficult places are the ones that have war or conflict. So we have Afghanistan and Pakistan and the Congo, uh, or places where there are, there's religious, a religious reason why people oppose this, northern Nigeria, where an emir uh, raised the question of whether the polio vaccine was in fact putting estrogen into children to limit population or whether it actually had HIV virus in it. For a year, children did not get immunized in northern Nigeria. Outbreaks occurred, spread to 12 countries before this all changed. The emir's son now works in polio eradication. One of the lessons is, if you tangle with culture, culture will always win. And so you don't go in and say, we're going to confront the religious people on this. Instead, WHO began getting all the vaccine for Nigeria from Indonesia made by Muslims, and then started working with the Muslim leaders. So this is going to be accomplished. It, I, to make this short, polio will be eradicated, but it's turned out to be so much more difficult. And part of the reason is the oral polio vaccine that we've all used here is much better in temperate climates than it is in tropical climates. It takes much more effort to get children immunized with this. My own feeling is that we should be using both the Salk and the Sabin vaccine in every child, and we have good scientific evidence that this decreases the number of visits you have to make to a child and improves their immunity. But uh, uh, here it's been difficult to actually change WHO's approach because They've taken the position people will lose confidence in us if we change the strategy. And I say, no, 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 they lose confidence if you have the wrong strategy, not if you change it. And, but even with just oral vaccine, it can be done. It's just much harder work than it should be. The second question about the Gates Foundation, that health is important for elimination of poverty. Can you expand on that? So the question about uh, Gates Foundation and the approach that is taken that health is one way to decrease poverty. There's really quite a bit of evidence now. It used to be that people would say you have to improve the socioeconomic status before you can improve health. And now there's evidence that it works both ways. And that if you get healthy people, then you're improving the economy. You have fewer people home from school, fewer people that can't get to, uh, the, uh, to the fields. And a good example is guinea worm. Guinea worm, it turned out, no one really knew this to start with, was the single biggest reason for school absenteeism in Nigeria. Guinea worm, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a parasite that people get from drinking contaminated water. It's a small larval form inside a water flea, and the water flea is just at the level where you can make it out if you hold up a glass of, of water. People drink this water. Twelve months later, they have a worm that's about three feet long. And bent on immortality, and the way that that's achieved is to lay eggs in water and keep the cycle going. And when they step in water twelve months later, to again get drinking water, and this is usually during the dry season. During the rainy season, you have enough water coming down that you catch off the, the roof. They step in the water and a blister breaks on their ankle and the uh, guinea worm lays eggs and the cycle gets repeated. When the guinea worm starts to exit the body, if you pull on it, you're likely to break it and then you have an infection up the entire leg. And these people end up with uh, 
with infectious knees and, and uh, uh, it, they really have a very bad time. So what they do is they pull it out a few inches a day and wrap it on a matchstick and every day a little bit more until the entire worm is out. And what they found there is that by getting rid of guinea worm it improves school attendance and it improves what the farmers can do at planting time and harvest time. So there is the, the connection again. It's like uh, Polybius said. It's so uh, intrinsic to life that health turns out to be a good wedge into the poverty situation. Yes? Foundation, I understand that DuPont was very instrumental in um, contributing um, filtering fabrics or uh, cutting down on the parasite. In general, I think in the popular culture in the United States, um, big corporations, particularly big pharma, big pharmaceuticals, uh, tend to be maligned. Um, but I gather from your book that, uh, from your experience at least, um, Merck, Pfizer, the big pharma companies have actually done a lot of good in the world by uh, well, I am so happy you asked me a question I can answer. Uh, it, we just had a celebration of the 25th anniversary of Mectazan from Merck. And Roy Vagelos, who had been the CEO of Merck at the time, and President Carter and myself did a roundtable discussion on the origins of the Mectazan program. Roy Vangelis was head of research when they discovered a drug that they took from a golf course in Japan and they found a substance in that dirt produced by bacteria in the dirt that could uh, prevent heartworm in dogs. Up until that time, if you had a dog, you used DEC every day but after that, you could buy something called Heart Guard, and there was a red heart, and you put that on your calendar, and that would tell you when to give the next uh, dose. It turned out to be very effective in dogs. And then a person said, I wonder if this wouldn't work in people. And so Roy Vangelis provided money from the, from the research team for a person to go to Africa and test this in people with onchocerciasis. And it turned out to be better in people than in dogs. Dogs you give it once a month, with people you give it once a year. But now they had a drug that was so good and so cheap and went to the poorest people in the world, there wasn't really a way to market it. And so Roy Vangelis came and asked, because I had worked in Africa and in smallpox, if they would give it away free, would I figure out a way to distribute it? So we figured out a way to distribute it where we don't even have a superstructure in WHO or UNICEF or any other UN organization. So it's really inexpensive compared to other programs. Instead, what we had was a committee that would decide on every application, are they able to show us that they will get the drug to the right people in the right dosage, and will they keep it out of the veterinary market? And we set a target of reaching six million people within six years. We did it in four years. Now why? Because Ordinarily, you wouldn't get people to take this drug if it's going to be 20 years before they realize they don't have blindness. I mean, we just don't think that way. It turns out that this disease causes such severe itching. And we lived in West Africa, so I have been able to sit around at night and watch these people just scratching all the time. One dose of Mectazan, and for many people, the next day was the first itch-free day they had ever recalled. And you don't have any trouble with marketing after that. <laughs> it turned out also that it was 100% effective in treating roundworms. And people know when they've been treated for roundworms. And again, this helped with the marketing. So all of a sudden, our numbers went up. And I went back to Africa for the 250 millionth treatment. And here we celebrated a few weeks ago the 25th anniversary. And they've now given 1 billion free treatments from Merck. I mean, this really is remarkable. Now you ask, well, what does Merck get out of this? They had hoped to get some pub good publicity and maybe some tax break on donations. What they actually got out of this was something far better than they could have ever expected. 
Nowadays, people don't have the loyalty to the company they start with. They move around wherever the salary is best. And now you suddenly have people that had a loyalty to Merck because they liked working for a company that did this. It was so dramatic that I was chairing the Mechtesan Committee in France on a Thursday afternoon. And at the end of the program, a man from WHO reported on a study where someone used two drugs, Mechtesan and Albendazole, in people with lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis and found that the two together had a beneficial effect. I couldn't understand why anyone would have done that because neither one alone had any beneficial effect. So what, you know, why would you put two things that don't work together? But anyway, they did and it, and it worked. So the question was, does anyone know who makes it? Yes, Smith, Klein, Beecham. Does anyone know anyone high enough in the c company to get some free so we could try it out and start a program. No one did. But we went to dinner just totally excited. Next morning, Friday morning, it's 10 o'clock. I'm still chairing the meeting and someone puts a note in front of me. President Carter is on the phone. Would you take the call? <laughs> he was actually uh, responsible for my paycheck at the time, so it uh, was more than a theoretical question. It, uh, <laughs> And he said, it's five o'clock in the morning in Atlanta, but he said, I couldn't sleep, I had to talk. He said, does the name Jan Leshley mean anything to you? And I said, no. He said, well, I had dinner with him last night in Washington, D.C. He is the CEO of Smith Klein Beecham. And he told me how impressed he was with what Merck was doing with Mechtesan and what it meant to employ loyalty. And he was asking President Carter, can you think of anything Smith Klein Beecham could do that would be similar? <laughs> I mean, talk about serendipity. By the end of the day, Jan Leshley had made a commitment and the Global Lymphatic Fulleriasis Program uh, was on the way. So when I would talk about Mechtesan at public health meetings, there was a small group that would always ask the question, how can you work with people that are working for profit? And so I came up with a stock answer about there's more, that we underestimate how much altruism you will find in people working for corporations, just as you underestimate how much greed you will find in public health and church workers. <laughs> and now everyone was angry, but you could start <laughs> on the conversation. And it's absolutely true. You, okay, you mentioned DuPont. It was a, a subdivision of DuPont called Precision Fabrics that made that first cloth. They committed to make a cloth that was welded every place that uh, the strings came across so that you wouldn't just use it a couple times and it would fall apart. And that it would be small enough weave that the water flea couldn't get through. And they also agreed to give the first million square yards free. Well. President Carter went to thank them uh, a year or so later and found out that they only made this cloth maybe one day every two months or so, but it was the lowest absenteeism they ever had when they would make that cloth. People did, in fact, want to be part of that. So now we have all kinds of companies providing actually billions of dollars of drugs because they have found that it's good business for them to do this. So I think this is the new chapter in global health, the chapter of pharmacophilanthropy, and that uh, we're just now beginning to, to figure out how to, to really use that. That was more than you asked for, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. You know, it's a surprising thing when you look at global health funds, how much of our total in the United States actually comes from church groups with small donations of people who have become interested in this. And it became clear with AIDS that AIDS orphans, uh, this is a problem that is not easily solved by a government. But every village in Africa 
as a Protestant church or a Catholic church or a Muslim congregation. These are the people who know who the grandmothers are that are taking care of the kids. And so uh, I do not want to do anything to diminish what wealthy people do. In fact, uh, one person that I know well in Africa, an African who's, who's wealthy, he and his wife now pay the school fees for 10,000 AIDS orphans. And so this really does make a difference. But don't underestimate what happens to uh, regular people, and particularly church people in this country, in their contributions to global health. One last question. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I used to teach a course at Emory where students had to answer that question and I would agree to get someone from the Gates Foundation for the final day as they summarized everything so that they knew they weren't doing this for a grade, they were doing this to try to change what happens. For uh, all of my 50 plus years in global health there has been this argument, horizontal programs uh, I mean uh, uh, vertical programs versus horizontal improvement of the infrastructure and the battle keeps going on and on and I always think it's time wasted to even battle it because in 1986 I was going to give the keynote talk at the American Public Health Association and I went back to see what were they talking about 100 years ago and found out they were talking about vertical versus horizontal, what's most efficient. And it, I thought this was a global health argument, not something that went back. But I said to myself, okay, we have 100 years of experience. What actually happened in this country? And what happened is very clear. Every time we had a tool, we used it. And every time we used it, we improved the infrastructure. And every time we improved the infrastructure, it made us better to take the next tool and use it. And so I think it's like this all the time and that it's not either or. So the question of uh, whether they should be spending more money in the infrastructure versus in vertical programs, that will continue to be a question. But the single biggest program that they have in global health is something called Gavi, which is a global alliance for vaccines and immunization. And a big part of that is actually coming up with ways that countries improve delivery in order to be eligible for the new vaccines. And so it is a combination of infrastructure and, and new tools. But it's asking that question that becomes important all the time so that you don't get into the certainty routine. And when, uh, when Warren Buffett gave the Gates such a big uh, challenge of spending his money also, I was asked by Patty Stonecipher, who was at that time the president of Global Health, what's the biggest risk we run in taking that money? And I said, I think the biggest risk is certainty. Because the more money you have, the more people bow to your decisions. And so if you say, we're gonna do it this way, they say, fine. And so you can't get them to be honest in their responses. And so we get into the same trap of we're certain this is the way and we don't hear people saying, but are you sure that's the way? So certainty is our biggest trap by having so much money. I say we, I, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> Thank you. So we are ready to go wonderful uh, and inspiring. Thanks. Thank you.